Yeah, whenever you want. <laughs> okay, I'm go so I got to get started. Welcome to the last uh, faculty lecture series of the semester. Uh, we will be resuming in the spring. Uh, our first one will probably be sometime in February. <coughs> uh, so look for the flyers. If you'd like to get email notices and you're not already getting email notices, there is a sign-up sheet in the front here. Sign your thank you, your name and your email as legibly as possible uh, to make sure that you do uh, get your email notices. There are also a few handouts left for today's talk. It's all different chemicals work, many left, so you might want to share. But I'd like to introduce our speaker, that's uh, Dr. Marty Jones, a professor of chemistry. And today he's going to talk about a um, holiday molecule. So let's welcome Dr. Jones. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for coming, and unless I forget, or uh, in case I forget at the end of the talk, I'll just wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday Season at this time. Um, and just a little note, I know that there are people who are going to be leaving partway through the presentation because of the wonderful percussion spectacular concert that's going on over in Richardson Hall at 730. You mean you're not in there? Uh, <laughs> not this year. I kind of screwed up when I uh, asked for this date. Uh, as Lisa implied, if I weren't here at this time, I would be over in that building getting ready to perform with the Community Steel Drum Band. So thank you again for coming, and we'll get the show on the road. Let's see if I can remember how to use this. Maybe it's this one. So just a brief outline of the presentation. I'll give you an introduction, talk a little bit about how we represent organic molecules because I know that not everyone out in the audience right now is an organic chemist. I see many students that I have had as uh, stu or many students that I've had in an organic type class before, so many of you will already know this. But uh, for those of you who are not organic chemists, a little bit about how they are represented. Then we'll go through a list of holiday molecules. And you have a sheet, or you may have access to a sheet that you can share with people that has some structures on it. Please don't be too frightened. We will not be able to cover all of those molecules. But at the end of the talk, I do have another handout that I can give you that lists all of those molecules and what their natural sources are. So we'll begin with something that's visual. I know in the little flyer that I produced for this, I indicated that uh, it was going to be odor and taste, and it will be primarily, but we are going to have to do just a couple of molecules that have to do with sight instead of just odor and taste. And then for odor, we'll start by tromping through the forest, perhaps in search of Christmas greens. Uh, then go home, set the right ambiance, and then get ready for a feast. And finally, end it all with wishing everyone a good night. So this doesn't necessarily look like it belongs in a talk about holiday molecules, but there is a reason for this. Robert Woodward, or R.B. Woodward, as he was commonly referred, is a very famous organic chemist who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1965 for work that he did on syntheses of any number of complex natural products or products that are found in nature. I had the good fortune when I was a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 1979 of being able to go to a lecture that Woodward gave at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. My postdoc advisor felt that it would be a really good experience for all his students and for me as the postdoc in the group to drive over to Madison, listen to Woodward talk. And as fate would have it, this was one of the last public lectures that Woodward gave before he died later on in 1979. At that time, the technology that was available for presentations such as this 
was an overhead projector and transparencies or 35 millimeter slides. That's what I grew up with. Well, sort of anyway. But Woodward did not even use that technology. Instead, what you see behind him is the way that he gave his presentations. A chalkboard with structures drawn very neatly on the chalkboard. And many of you, especially those of you who have had me for a student at some time in your life, know that I really like to use a blackboard as well. So tonight, instead of the typical PowerPoint type of presentation, we're going to go through and I'm going to give you a chalk talk on these molecules. So up with the screen, off with the projector, at least for temporary purposes, and up with the lights so that you can see. And I should thank our custodial staff for doing such a great job of cleaning that blackboard. It's not going to remain that way for very long. <sighs> now, I have to tell you that I am not R.B. Woodward. I mean, you could tell because I have a beard, right? I'm also not a Nobel Prize winning chemist. Woodward could do all his presentations just from memory. I'm not going to be that good, okay? So I have some notes in front of me. I will have to refer to these notes as I draw the structures. Another thing to, to warn you about is right now, it feels pretty warm in this room to me, and I'm not used to wearing a sweater. So at some point, if I feel that I'm starting to get overheated, this sweater is coming off. Don't faint because I do have a shirt on underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty warm right now. A second thing that I want to point out is that although in the little flyer I promised no quiz at the end of the presentation, didn't say anything about quiz questions during the presentation. <laughs> so it's entirely possible. I do have a few door prizes, and so correct quiz answerers could walk away from here with a fabulous door prize, or a door prize anyway, it might not be fabulous. And the last thing that I need to point out to you, I've kind of alluded to this already, many of these natural containing, or many of these products are only one out of hundreds, literally hundreds of compounds that can be found in some of these plants and products that we associate with the holiday. Uh, for example, in 1994, there was a study done on odor, component, odor components of Parmigiano cheese. And there were about 167 different odor components identified by gas chromatography and mass spectroscopy. So I guess we could give an entire talk just on Parmigiano cheese, but that's not something that everybody associates with a holiday molecule. So <laughs> I'm, I'm only going to be talking about a few, a select few molecules that contribute to odors and tastes and sights that we associate with holiday molecules. So we begin over here. You guys all know what this is. A poinsettia. Do you know the origin of the name? So poinsettia comes from, oh, oh, do you know? Yes, Joel Poinsett was a minister to Mexico in the mid 1800s, like 1825 originally from South Carolina, I believe. And he grew so enamored of the poinsettia plant, which was native to Mexico and certainly not native to the United States, that when he returned to the United States, he brought with him the poinsettia plant. We associate this with the holiday, perhaps because of the traditional Christmas colors, green and red. And so our first molecules deal with the colors that we see in this poinsettia.
By the way, part of the reason that you have this sheet in front of you is so you can keep me honest on the structures. Oh, I forgot we have to go back and do the representations of the organic molecules. Ah. We'll, we'll save this. We'll come back to it. <laughs> For you non-organic chemists, organic chemistry is the study of carbon-containing compounds. There are lots of general chemistry students here tonight. What do we call this kind of a structure? The one that has all the bonds shown, all the non-bonding electrons. Oh, you've covered this, haven't you, Dr. Beaton, Dr. Adams? Yes. What do we call these kinds of structures? Loud voice, confident voice. Lewis structures. This is the structure of a molecule that you actually have in your medicine chest at home, or many of you have in your medicine chest. This is 2-propanol, better known as isopropyl alcohol, which is the major component of rubbing alcohol. But it takes quite a while to draw out the full Lewis structure, so chemists have come up with different ways of representing these molecules while still, as long as you know the rules, still transmitting the same information. A condensed structure involves not showing the bonds to hydrogen. There are three hydrogens attached to this carbon, so we write it as a CH3. We do have to show the bond to oxygen, so we get something like this. All right, you organic chemists in the audience, my current students, what kind of a structure do we call this? Condensed, right. <laughs> a condensed structure. Still takes a little more time to draw, so the fastest way is called a skeletal structure. And in the skeletal structure, we do not show the individual carbon atoms. We do show the non-carbon atoms. And at the end of a line, or wherever there's a change in the angle, that constitutes a carbon. So this represents a CH3, a CH with an OH, and a CH3. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, we can come back to this molecule. Do you have a question, Don? <laughs> what? No, you're right, it's not. But there's going to be erasure marks all throughout the talk. Oh, let's see, where was I here? Oh, yeah. You guys can check for chlorophyll A and see if this is the correct structure or whether I have left I something I out. Bond. I forgot a double bond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good catch. When you're under the lower F1, isn't there a double bond to be under the N and not away from it, or does that matter? The lower F and the lower left N. The lower left N. Oh, yes, it should. Yes, it does matter. And the reason it does matter is because this is a coordinate covalent bond between nitrogen and magnesium. This is just an association between the nitrogen and the magnesium, so a different type of bond. And notice that these bonds involve nitrogens that don't have double bonds to them. 
So that's a very good catch, and it is an important consideration. So this is chlorophyll A. And this is responsible for the green color in plants, or that's one of the components that's responsible for the green color in plants. Um, one thing that I want to point out to you, this may become important later on, if you catch my drift, is the fact that we have a series of double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, and so on. That's called a conjugated system. And when those types of conjugated systems are present, the molecule can absorb light in the visible region, which means that we can see the non-absorbed light, because that's also in the visible region. So it's green because of all this extensive conjugation that we have. But it must not be chlorophyll that is responsible for the red color in the bracts of the poinsettia plant. Instead, It is this molecule, which is an anthocyanin that goes by the name of pelargonin. Pelargonin, why do you suppose that we can see the color associated with pelargonin? This is an audience participation moment. I don't know. What? The double bonds arranged how? In a conjugated fashion. Look at all these double bonds that are conjugated with one another. There are many anthocyanins. And they differ slightly in structure, but they have this same basic ring structure. There are different OHs, and some of them are hydrogens, and, and so on. But this is one example of an anthocyanin that leads to a red color. There's one other thing that I want to point out to you in this molecule. This functionality, where we have an OH group that's bonded to an aromatic ring, is called a phenol functional group. And when you look at pelargonin, there are three phenol functional groups. This then becomes a polyphenolic material and some of the polyphenolic materials are called flavanols. Whoops. And we find, we're going to see these flavanols in a variety of different locations in molecules today. Um, so now we're finished with the site and we're ready to go tromp through the forest a little bit in search of some pine boughs or perhaps a Christmas tree. And as you wander through the forest, what might you experience? <coughs> what smell? Pine. A pine smell. Fur. And the fur smell and the balsam smell and so on. And one of the major components of that odor <laughs> is this. Appropriately enough, this is alpha pinene. <laughs> a minor component of this, beta pinene, simply has a double bond here instead of here. So let's test the number, let's, let's test how much you remember about the representations of the structures by having you count the number of carbons in this molecule. I hope there's 10. If there's more than 10, I've drawn it incorrectly. Are there 10? 10. Uh, 10 is a multiple of 5, is it not? So for my organic <laughs> students, what kind of a molecule is this likely to be? A terpene, exactly. 
Terpene are generally plant-derived materials that are built up from what is called isoprene, and isoprene contains five carbons. So if you take two isoprene units, put them together, that gives you 10 carbons, add another five, 15, and so on. Terpenes, or terpene-like materials, generally are always have multiples of five carbons. So a pine scent. Here in Colorado, we might also find something else as we're wandering through the forest in search of that perfect tree. And perhaps while I draw this next structure, I can convince Dr. Duran to tell you a little bit about mistletoe. <laughs> she, she knows this is coming, okay? <laughs> so. Excellent, thank you very much. And this is not called dung on a branch, but this is instead called betulinic acid. Betulinic acid. It is one of a myriad of components that are found in mistletoe. A pretty interesting compound. If you were to count the carbons, and I'm not asking you to do this at this time, but if you were to count them, you would find that there are 30 carbons in here, which means that this must be a terpene-like material. An interesting thing about betulinic acid is that derivatives of this are currently being investigated for use in cancer treatment, particularly leukemia and um, ovarian cancers. This group you're going to see frequently as we wander through holiday molecules and that is called a carboxylic acid. That's where the term acid in betulinic acid comes from. But keep your eye open for molecules that contain a carboxylic acid functional group. Um, you know, there's a tradition that has grown up around mistletoe involving kissing whoever happens to be standing underneath a sprig of mistletoe. I couldn't find any mistletoe in Alamosa. Um, at least not in the places that I looked. So we're not going to be following that tradition here tonight, <laughs> but the, that, that tradition seems to have arisen, the modern tradition anyway, seems to have arisen from the British. Uh, but stories and mythology about mistletoe go back to the Romans and the Druids and the Norse uh, and the Celts. So where the tradition involving actually kissing under the mistletoe for good luck, uh, where, it, where it originally uh, originated from, probably the British at this point. All right, so see you guys. Uh, at this time, we're going to move out of the forest and into the house and perhaps try to set the right ambiance for inviting guests over for a holiday feast. So, perhaps involved in setting the right ambiance would be to have an appropriate odor in the house. And we could, for example, light a candle. Anybody here allergic to burning wax or anything? Oh, maybe it won't get up that far. So, this particular candle, as long as I don't blow it out. And if you were here a few years ago, I gave a talk on, on candles, uh, Michael Faraday's Christmas candle lecture. So I couldn't really do this without a candle of some sort. This is a candle that was made by Suzanne Ortega up in Crestone. And this particular candle is infused with the pinene, with uh, 
the odor associated with that. So we'll burn that, maybe get a little bit of pine odor in the room. But another one, if we want to go further back in history, think about the Magi and the gift that supposedly was brought to baby Jesus. Frankincense and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh. And I do have another candle over here, also made by Suzanne Ortega which is a frankincense and myrrh candle. I'm not going to burn this one, we'll leave it intact. But again, there are many odor components associated with both frankincense and myrrh. I'm just going to choose a couple. Uh, as you look at the beginning of this, those of you who have been through organic chemistry or biochemistry, or even Chemistry 105, will recognize that this looks like the beginning of a steroid nucleus. But it is not. <laughs> because it has two more six-membered rings instead of a five-membered ring. And if we put bonds in at the right spots, let's see. Oh, whoops. I used to know this one better, but obviously I don't remember it any longer. All right. This compound is beta boswellic acid. Beta boswellic acid. It gets its name from the fact that the trees which provide the resin from which frankincense is derived are from the Boswellia trees, trees that are native to Oman, Yemen, Somalia, and other parts of the Mideast. So as you can see, both from the name and from the structure, we have a carboxylic acid functional group in this molecule as well. Myrrh comes from resins from a camophora tree, and that contains this molecule. Nope. Which is furanoudesma 1,8-diene. The furano comes from this portion of the molecule, eudesma from the other portion of the molecule. All right, so again, this plant, the camophora tree, also grows in the same general vicinity, Oman, Yemen, Somalia, other parts of the Middle East. These trees are highly prized for the aromatic resins that they produce, um, uh, the frankincense and myrrh. So I'm going to blow this out. We don't need to add any more heat to the room. <coughs> Do any of you, as a part of your Christmas tradition, set out or create a gingerbread house? All right, a couple of people do, because if you create a gingerbread house, then one of the key ingredients is ginger. And ginger has a couple of different flavor components to it. This is called Zingarone. Would you agree that ginger has a kind of a zingy taste? Yeah, and I'm not sure that that's where the name actually comes from, 
but certainly helps to describe the, uh, the Zingarone. Um, and now we've set the ambiance for the holiday feast. The visitors are starting to arrive. What might you do first when a guest steps into your house? Take their hat. Okay, yeah, take their hat and coat and so on, unless they're at our house where it's cool enough that they may want to leave that on. But Ted, what did you say? Offer them a drink. What would you like to drink? How? Ethanol? Yeah. But certainly something that contains ethanol. Not every one of you are of legal drinking age. So, but how about a little red wine? Fits with the holiday season. All right, this molecule is resveratrol. What do you notice about resveratrol? Here is the first quiz question for a door prize. Okay, conjugated. That's not the answer I'm looking for. A polyphenolic material. Who said that? Was it in the back row? All right. <laughs> Casey, I'll actually give you your choice of the candle or the poinsettia or the do-it-yourself gingerbread house kit. What would you like? Poinsettia. Says poinsettia. <laughs> what do you guys know about resveratrol? You've certainly heard of it before. Yeah. What? Antioxidant. Polyphenolic materials are, in fact, good antioxidants. There are some studies which suggest that resveratrol, you're welcome, that resveratrol can slow down the aging process in certain organisms. And we'd like to think that it would slow down the aging process in humans, although I'm not sure that that's been definitively proven. Well, it's working for Ted. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to get a sufficient amount of resveratrol to slow down the aging process significantly, you would have to drink more red wine than uh, then would be advisable for you to drink because of the other components, ethanol. However, I think you can get resveratrol supplements. I don't know, do you guys have any out at the food co-op? Yeah, so if you want, you can get resveratrol supplements. Pretty simple molecule as a polyphenolic material. All right, so what about for those of you, no, 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 not yet. So uh, my students know that I talk to myself, so it, it's okay. <coughs> so I have a good friend who uh, does like eggnog, but he likes it better if there is something besides just eggnog present. Maybe a little bit of rum uh, put in the eggnog. And rum is one of those beverages that contains hundreds of different flavor and odor components. This is one of them. Very simple molecule. This is called isobutyl propionate. A very simple molecule. It cl it's classified as an ester. And if you were to go upstairs to our stock room and find a bottle of isobutyl propionate, it would have an odor somewhat at least reminiscent of rum the actual odor profile, because of there are so many compounds in it, there's going to be more than just the, uh, than the one isobutyl propionate. But now finally, what about those of us, or those of you, who are too young to legally consume alcohol, or maybe your guests have small children with them, or maybe it's a bitter cold night and you want some mulled cider. Anybody have mulled cider at the holiday season? 
Yeah, a few people. What are some common mulling spices? Cloves. Cinnamon. Okay, hang on, I can't write that fast. <coughs> Nutmeg. Anything else? Oranges? Uh, we're going to get to oranges as a part of something else in a minute. How about ginger? All right, so cinnamon contains this molecule. Aptly named cinnamaldehyde. Cloves contain a molecule called eugenol. Nutmeg contains something that is quite different as one of its major components, different than anything that I've put up on the board thus far. And I'm not going to draw this in a skeletal structure because it's actually faster to draw it in a condensed fashion. I lose count drawing out all these CH2 groups. Okay. <laughs> if I were to draw it out in a skeletal fashion, this is a compound called trimeristin. So how many of you go to a physician on a regular basis and get your blood drawn and have tests done on your blood? What's one of the things that you, that you get analyzed? on a routine sort of blood profile. Cholesterol? What? Resveratrol? <laughs> I'm not sure that's a part of the normal blood profile, right? <coughs> How about triglycerides? Do you guys get triglycerides? This, my friends, is a triglyceride. So please don't ingest a big bowl of nutmeg before you go off for one of your blood tests, okay? Uh, ginger, we've already seen that ginger contains zingarone. It also contains another compound called zingerberine. And I'm not gonna draw that on the board because we're already starting to run out of time here. Um, but it's on the structures, in the, in the structure table there. All right, so let's just do a couple of appetizers. I'm not going to do them all. And th these are going to be kind of personal appetizers for, for me. One of the things that I really have enjoyed recently, because they're very simple, are Parmesan chips, Parmesan cheese <coughs> chips. All you do is take a spoonful of shredded Parmesan cheese, put it on a cookie sheet, stick it into the oven at 400 degrees for about three to five minutes, and it comes out like a potato chip, except that it's made of Parmigiano cheese. And Parmigiano cheese, not everybody likes it, and I understand that. Um, maybe this is one reason why not everybody likes it. So what functional group do you guys see here? A carboxylic acid. Let's see. It's about time for another giveaway. So Clara, I think you were the first one to say that. Is that right? Or was it? It came from over here. It was Clara? OK. So Clara, you have your choice of the frankincense myrrh candle or the gingerbread house kit. OK. You're welcome. This is butyric acid. Hmm. Most of you probably because of modern refrigeration techniques 
in the uh, modern refrigeration period may not have ever smelled rancid butter in your life. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yes. Butyric acid is one of the odor components of rancid butter. Um, so it has kind of a sharp odor and a sharp taste, the Parmesan cheese crisps, partly because of that, partly also because of this material. I love these simple molecules that I can actually draw. Glutamic acid is one of the 20 common amino acids that make up the proteins in your body. If you remove one of the hydrogens from one of the carboxylic acid functional groups, you get glutamate. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with MSG, or monosodium glutamate, a flavor enhancer, at least partly responsible for another taste besides salt, sour, bitter, sweet, that is termed umami. Parmesan cheese has a pretty high concentration, in a, in a relative sense anyway, of glutamic acid. And so we get that savory taste or that umami flavor from the Parmesan cheese, from that particular component. A healthy snack or a healthy appetizer for those of you who are involved in uh, healthy foods and gardens and things of that sort might be carrots. And carrots contain this. Let's see if I have counted this correctly. One, two, three. This is beta carotene. Was anybody by any chance counting the carbons as I was writing the structure on the board? Scott, did you count those carbons? <sighs> Tyler, there are 40. That makes this compound a tetraterpene. Okay, a tetraterpene, 40 carbons in it, present in all sorts of yellow and orange vegetables. And we see a lot of this because we are blessed to live in Colorado. So at Mid-September to mid-October, when the aspen are turning from their nice green summer color into the golden foliage, chlorophyll production goes down, carotene production takes over, and we see the nice yellow color in the leaves from carotene. All right. Enough of the appetizers and on to the main course and side dishes. What do you guys serve for uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner? Turkey. Turkey. Thank you. I didn't even have to pay her to say that. Uh, so this should look familiar to several folks. This is another one of the 20 common amino acids that make up the proteins in our body. This is tryptophan. Do any of you attribute <coughs> your post-Christmas dinner or post-Thanksgiving dinner nap to eating turkey? Yeah. I'm sorry, that is no longer allowed. Okay? Well, 
Like no, you can adapt, right? You can think of something else. Tryptophan is a, pre a precursor to the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is something that is responsible for good feelings. And, and uh, the problem is that tryptophan is only present in turkey protein to the extent of about 1.1%, less than even a statistical distribution if all the amino acids were present in the same amount. So there's not enough tryptophan to be converted into serotonin. Why do you fall asleep instead? Yeah, because you've eaten a hell of a lot of food. <laughs> and so all the mashed potatoes and dressing and carrots and wine, if you've had wine, are heading to your stomach and you need to get the blood flow away from your brain down into your digestive tract so that you can digest some of that food. If you really want to use it as an excuse, Lisa, then you need to eat something other than turkey. Chicken? No, 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 no. Just try drinking a glass of milk. Milk has about twice the amount of tryptophan that turkey does. Or eat a handful of sesame seeds, because the protein in sesame seed is fairly rich in tryptophan, at least on a relative, uh, a relative basis. I must confess that I am partial to having dressing with my turkey, and I like the variety that my wife makes, which includes bread. Uh, well, sure. Uh, <laughs> again, a nice, easy structure to draw, because we're not going to draw the entire structure. It would take me the rest of the night and all the boards in the building if I were going to draw out a complete structure. This is the structure of a polymer that we know as starch. Starch is in bread, it's in any uh, pasta, any sort of starchy food, potatoes in the mashed potatoes and so on. But this is starch. Uh, Diana likes to put sage in her dressing and I like to eat sage. Whoops. Sage contains a really interesting molecule. I believe this is the correct structure, but I'll check to be certain. So this is a compound called fujone. Why does fujone look kind of odd? Especially because, Dr. Novotny, why does Thujone look kind of odd for a natural product? The three-membered ring. Uh, the three-membered ring, the cyclopropane ring, a lot of ring strain. Nature likes stability. And a cyclopropane ring has a lot of energy built up in what is called ring strain because of the angles of the carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds in this. So Thujone, present in sage, but it's also present in wormwood, and there is a particular type of alcoholic beverage that is made that supposedly comes, or well, maybe not supposedly, comes from, from wormwood. Dr. Novotny, you were shaking your head. Do you know again? I drank it. I don't remember what it was. Oh, <laughs> what is it? Absinthe. Absinthe, yes. Did absinthe make? The heart uh, No, 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 no. I was thinking <laughs> that did drinking absinthe cause Van Gogh to go kind of crazy and cut off his ear? I think I've heard stories to that effect, but I have no idea whether they are true or not. Celery goes in, but I'm going to skip over celery given the time and move on to one more molecule in the dressing, in, or, or one more uh, component of the dressing, onions. And I usually get to cut up the onions uh, that go into the dressing. How many of you enjoy cutting up onions? <laughs> oh, some of you, okay, great. Do your eyes tear up when, when you, sometimes? What? Chew bubble gum? How does that keep your eyes from tearing up? Huh, okay, so. 
<laughs> Next time, try bubble gum if you don't want to tear up. But if you're like me and you do tear up, it's because of this. Very simple molecule. It's called thiopropanol S oxide. Interestingly enough, this does not exist in that fashion in the onion. I mean, when you peel the outer layers from an onion, can you hold it up to your eyes without tearing up? I can. Certainly hold it up to my nose. I can kind of smell it, but it doesn't cause me to tear up. It's not a lacrimator like this because this, this happens when you cut into the onion because as you break the cells in the onion, you release an enzyme called alanase, which begins to convert thiopropanol, or thiopropanol into the S oxide. And this is the active lacrimator that causes your eyes to, to tear up. One more thing that's a part of onion, and given the time, I think this will be the last quiz question. So there's only one prize left. It is this frankincense and myrrh candle. This molecule is called quercetin. And here's the question. What molecule that has already been on the board most closely resembles quercetin? Pelargonin, the anthocyanine. All right. Here. Can you just pass this back to Tyler? This is another polyphenolic material, a flavanol, an antioxidant. Can you get quercetin supplements at the Valley Food Co-op? Yes, you can get quercetin supplements as well. Good polyphenolic material like this. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Uh, and I don't have a prize for this quiz question, but this is going to be, you, you only have, go ahead. Q10? Q10? Oh, no, not coenzyme Q. Uh -uh, no, that wasn't going to be the question. Uh, so the question is, do you think that quercetin is present in larger amounts in yellow onions or red onions? Yellow, yellow, yellow. red, <laughs> yellow, red. Let's see, what color was pelargonin? Red. Do you think this is present in larger amounts in red onions then? Say yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Just a, just a few more. <clears throat> in the announcement, in the little flyer for this talk, one thing that I specifically mentioned that has been a part of uh, my family's holiday tradition for more years than I can count is a cranberry orange relish. Just grind up some fresh cranberries with a whole orange, add a little bit of sugar, less than the recipe in the Betty Crocker cookbook, if you know what's good for you. Mix it all together, let it sit for an, uh, at least an hour, preferably overnight and you have a wonderful treat to accompany a turkey dinner. Well, both cranberries and oranges contain this molecule. This is ascorbic acid. You might know it better as vitamin C. What's curious about this molecule is that it doesn't contain a carboxylic acid group. All the other so-called acids that I've shown you tonight contained a carboxylic acid, a C double bond O, O, H. But when you take a vitamin C tablet, does it taste sour? To you? 
Yeah, it does. It tastes sour. And sour is a characteristic flavor that we associate with acidic substances. So this ascorbic acid does behave in every way as an acid. It just doesn't contain a carboxylic acid functional group. Again, this is present both in the cranberries as well as the oranges. So by eating the cranberry orange relish, you don't need to take a vitamin C tablet that day. You can just scarf down the uh, cranberry orange relish. And because the orange peel, the orange rind, actually goes into the making of this cranberry orange relish, you're going to be ingesting some of this molecule as well. What is this, Keiko? This is limonene. Present in the rinds of any sort of a citrus fruit. Okay. Sweet potatoes contain beta carotene. Pumpkin pie contains beta carotene, as well as the materials from nutmeg and ginger and allspice. Uh, I haven't given you anything from allspice because we're just going to have to wrap things up a little bit. But no meal would be complete without something that contains this molecule, probably more than one thing that contains this molecule. Uh, no, that's at the very last. Oh, darn, jump the gun. Uh, well, just be patient, Dr. Novotny. <laughs> to be honest, I can't imagine you having a Thanksgiving dinner without a helping of this substance. <laughs> a little bit of sucrose is exactly right. Now, on your sheet, I've drawn it a slightly different way because it takes up more room when you draw it like this. You'll have some of this in pumpkin pie. You'll have some of this in uh, pecan pie. You'll have some of this in the cranberry orange relish. In almost any sweet dessert, you're going to have some of this. Now, here in the valley, another common dessert, or a, a special treat for me anyway, during this time of year, is biscochitos. What goes into biscochitos? Anise. Anise. Lard, yes. <laughs> this is a compound called anethole, or at least I think this is the structure of anethole. And anethole is one of the components that goes into anise flavoring. So on your way out tonight, if you feel a need to cleanse your palate from the popcorn, and there's still some pretzels left, by the way, so grab a handful before you go. But on your way out, if you would like to cleanse your palate, we have some of Bob's delicious peppermint candy canes. We'll just open those up so that you can take one with you or two with you if you're so inclined. And by the way, here is the, the listing of the molecules and their sources. I'll just put it right here if you want to take one of those. Peppermint contains menthol. This is the structure of menthol. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Novotny mentioned he knows that I really like spicy foods. Green chili, red chili, doesn't really matter which. Both of them contain a flavor ingredient called capsaicin. And our capsaicin is usually ingested the day after Thanksgiving rather than on Thanksgiving Day itself because we take the turkey leftovers 
and convert them into green chili turkey enchiladas, or recently, green chili turkey pozole. Yes, it is very good. <laughs> Let's see here. And this is the structure of capsaicin. Now then, in a bow to modern technology, as much of a dinosaur as I am, there's some things that probably are easier to do with technology, with the currently available technology. So let me turn off the lights. You guys aren't afraid of the dark, are you? <laughs> now I just have to see if I can find my way back over here to, I don't remember which, oh, where's the button? Is it this one? It is. All right. So there's Woodward. Here is the structure of what? I want you guys to ruminate on this for just a minute. Think about what, what structure that is. Chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A. So as you are sitting in one of my presents, think about chlorophyll. Think about the structure that you see with the main body and then this long tail coming out. And maybe if you've been a good person throughout the entire year, maybe you'll be lucky enough to hear little footprints on the roof. <laughs> and if you do, then it may be <laughs> so, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. And thank you for coming. I'll be happy to see you. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.